What else are you doing to reduce pollution and improve the environment? First of all, and it, it, it's always the, the unfashionable thing to say, but I, I think the beginning of any sensible energy and climate change strategy is energy efficiency. Um, I mean, the best energy, the cheapest energy, the, the, the cleanest energy is the energy we do not use. And I think all of us recognize that in terms of our, our businesses, our offices, and indeed our homes, because our housing is responsible for a significant proportion of carbon emissions, we can become more energy e efficient in, in all, sorts of, all sorts of ways, better insulation of our dwellings, being more sensible about turning off appliances, etc., etc. Now, I, I don't welcome the very, very high prices of energy at the moment, but I guess one upside to that is that people will, will actually be, be more aware of the bills they're paying for their energy and actually may start to conserve in a way they haven't done before. So I think energy efficiency is point number one on the agenda, the first bu bullet point, and then in no particular order in, in Britain and indeed across the European Union, we're taking renewables very seriously. So across the European Union now, we've set ourselves a very demanding target that by 2020, we want one fifth, 20% of all of our energy, not just electricity, all of our energy coming from renewables. And we're working out what the different share will be for different countries. Ours is likely to be 15% there or thereabouts. Well, when I tell you in Britain, only 2% of our total energy comes from renewables, two to 15, that's demanding. That's a, a, a crucial target. You set pretty high targets for clean energy production. How does this fit with the um, energy supply of oil and gas. Essentially, we see the future as an economy that continues to grow, uh, in, 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 can, it continues to be productive, but where we're taking the carbon essentially out of the economy. Now, how do we square that with fossil fuels? The fact of the matter is that whatever some of the fringe green environmentalists might wish, uh, we're going to be burning fossil fuels for what? another hundred or more years. You're not going to say to nations in North America or China, hey, don't use that coal, don't use your oil and gas. Of course not. So the challenge is how do we develop technologies, clean coal technologies, technologies around carbon capture and sequestration, whereby we can continue to use fossil fuels, where oil and gas are a crucial part of the economy still, but where we've actually managed to take the carbon out. Now, talking about the economy and climate change, what percentage of GDP are you willing to exchange for these carbon reductions? We're not fixing a, a, a percentage, but we, we do recognize that there, there are costs in, in tackling climate change. I mean, in simple terms, we cannot save the planet on the cheap. Well, do you think we should trade off and uh, use these targets as bargaining chips to bring China and India into this program? Just first say something more about the, the costs. Um, Certainly. So, so Nick Stern, Nicholas Stern in, in Britain, one of our most eminent economists, produced a report that's you know, become well-known worldwide, the Stern Report. And, and what Nick Stern is saying is that, you know, yes, tackling climate change involves significant costs, but he, he says two other things. One is that the costs will be significantly less if we take action early. And the second thing Nick Stern says, and I, I find more, more and more people in industry now um, understanding this, is that there are new commercial opportunities as you start to decarbonize the economy. How do you think we can bring China and India to the fold on this? Um, I think what we've got to do is recognize that we have a shared problem as a planet. Um, I think at the moment that there are still too many people pointing fingers at one another. So the, the developing world, um, China and India, we say China and India, but of course some of the South American economies, South Africa, uh, it's not just China and India, but they're the obvious examples, may, may say to the West, look, it's you guys that did it, yeah? Um, you sort it out, um, and then if we're convinced you're taking action, we may follow. Whereas I think there are people in the West who say, look, what's the point of us in Britain or Denmark or even the United States doing this if there isn't action in China and India? I mean, th that, that's a, a fruitless debate. I mean, what we've got to do, I think, is accept well, actually the evidence from the International Energy Agency that says, yes, up to now, it's we in the West that have been largely responsible um, because of our economies for carbon emissions, largely responsible for global warming. But when you project forward in terms of the energy demand 
in, in China and India and those other nations and, and their growing share of carbon emissions, they in the future become largely responsible. So surely out of this it's not impossible to get a negotiated settlement that says, okay, there are different historical phases, but we've now got a shared problem, and together we've got to take action. Now, you know, that, that's, the, that's the opening paragraph. Obviously, in terms of the negotiations, it, it gets more difficult. But we live on just one planet. We sometimes behave in terms of energy extravagance, as if we've got an, two other planets we can go on to. Well, actually, I tell you, we've only got the one planet, and we share the planet, and we've got to work together on it. Mr. Wicks, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm Richard Loomis for World Energy Television, and we've been talking with Malcolm Wicks, Energy Minister of State for the United Kingdom. Thank you very much for tuning in. Welcome to World Energy Television. I'm Richard Loomis, President and CEO. And today we have the honor of visiting with Professor Ian Bryden, Chairman of Renewable Energy for the University of Edinburgh. Professor, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Earlier, I had the opportunity to interview Malcolm Wicks, Energy Minister for the UK, uh, regarding targets and things that were happening in mean, energy in general. One of the things we talked about was renewable energy. Perhaps you could discuss some of the targets that the UK has for renewable energy. Well, the, the principal target at the moment is uh, to achieve 10% of uh, all electricity generated in the United Kingdom by renewable energy by 2010. That's a, an ambitious target and it's only two years away now, so that uh, is focusing people's minds quite dramatically. However, within the United Kingdom, if you go to Scotland, there's mm. a, a different set of targets. In Scotland, the target is 18% by 2010, and that appears to have been achieved within Scotland. Really? But there is also the very dramatic target of 50% by 2020, which uh, uh, is going to be a, a very great uh, challenge, both technically and economically, to achieve. Scotland is at what level now? Uh, Scotland is rather more than 20 percent at the moment. And the UK is targeting 10 percent in total? That's correct, yes. Of all the renewable types of energy uh, that are possible, uh, where is the majority of this power coming from? At the moment it's wind, uh, specifically onshore wind where the, the bulk of the development over the past few years has been focused. This is because that's uh, essentially mature technology. We know how to do it, we know how to install the turbines, we know how to build them and we know how to export the energy. As we move forward to 2010 towards 2020, we expect to see new renewables, specifically wave and tidal marine resources, to, to take a, a measurable proportion of that, uh, that target. Uh, at the moment, I think it's possibly too early to make a, a definitive estimate, but I, I would say they could be looking at 25% uh, of the renewable contingent by 2020, but uh, I fully expect to be proved wrong. 20% with tidal? 20% combined between okay. wave and tidal. Um, but, I mean, that's a, that is literally a guess. <laughs> How much power does that represent? We are, we are currently expecting of the order of 3 gigawatts uh, installed capacity for uh, marine renewable energy. That's wave and tidal combined by mm -hmm. 2020. We have to learn quite a bit between now and then to be able to achieve it. It's not going to be an easy target, but mm -hmm. I, I think it's a, a perfectly reasonable target. Um, to put that in some terms we might all understand, how much power is 3 gigawatts? 3 gigawatts is probably about the power output from uh, 2 to 3 large nuclear power stations. So significant? Significant, yes. That would be enough to power? It would be enough if uh, you had it all in stream at the same time to power the m most of Scotland, probably 50 to 60 percent of Scotland's uh, requirement. Uh, or if you look at it in the, the, the broader UK sense, perhaps to power the city of Birmingham. I see.